Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Bhagavan also suggested some innovations in the presentation of the forthcoming French edition of Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, which will go into production shortly. He plans to remove the painting depicting the creation from the front cover and put it inside on the end papers. He wants to put a painting of Krishna and Balaram on the cover which he thinks will help increase the door-to-door -door sales. <coughs> Prabhupada was all smiles hearing his report. Nothing pleases him more than news of his books being sold or news of how the people of the world are appreciating them. He approved the idea for a new cover and told Bhagavan his ideas were very good. He said that Bhagavan should sell books in huge quantity and then print again. However, not every GBC man is experiencing such success. Brahmananda Swami sent yet another disheartening report. Although he is working hard, fulfilling many roles as GBC Nairobi Temple President, Life Membership Director, Correspondent Secretary and so on, he seems to have become despondent in his attempt to preach in Africa. He has major problems to deal with and very few devotees to help him. Nanda Kumar Swami is there, but he is untrained and cannot cope with more than just the Pujari work and cooking. <laughs> So today we're reading from uh, Canto number six of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Today we're reading from chapter number five, entitled Nar Narad Muni Cursed by Prajapati Daksha. And today we're reading from text number 37. So if you can repeat after me. Rine Stri Bira Muktana. Rine Stri Bira Muktana. Mimam Sita Karmana. Yeah. Nice. 
Prajapati Daksha said, My sons were not all freed from their three debts. Indeed, they did not properly consider their obligations. O Narad Muni, O personality of sinful action, you have obstructed their progress toward good fortune in this world and the next because they are still indebted to the saintly persons, the demigods, and their father. So I think you will remember the context of the story, but Prajapati Daksha had 10,000 sons, and Prajapati means one who is meant to populate the universe. So the service of Daksha is to increase the population in the universe. So Daksha was having a difficult time increasing the population. So then what happened is he performed uh, uh, many prayers and a yagya. And then finally he uni united with his wife, Ashikni. And from them 10,000 sons were born and they were known as the uh, Haryashvas. But then what happened is those Haryashvas, 10,000 sons, they went to a place called Narayana Saras. And there they began to execute austerity. Because before you can procreate, before you become a, a father or a mother, you should become qualified yourself. Because if you're a father or a mother, then it means you become a guru. So before you become a guru and have children, you should also uh, improve your own character. Um, and therefore they went to perform austerities before they took up uh, parenthood. But when Narad Muni saw these 10,000 sons and they were very, very qualified, so then he said to them, why are you going into married life? Why are you going to get into so much entanglement? You can just take the fast path. Uh, so then he convinced them. Narad Muni was very convincing. Some preachers, they're very, very convincing. Book distributors like that. They can convince anyone. So Narad Muni convinced the Haryashvas. So Prajapati Daksha got very angry because this was his great chance to populate the universe. And 10,000 sannyasis in one go. <laughs> a big hit, you know? So then Daksha tried again, so then Daksha had another thousand sons. And these thousand sons went to the same place. And Narad Muni, you know, like if you're a good book distributor and you find a good town where you can distribute a lot of books, <laughs> then you go there again, you know, and <laughs> you try to do another good day on the Sankirtan. So when these other thousand sons came to this place, Narad Muni came there again. <laughs> And uh, 1,000 sons he again made them all sannyasis. He said, why, why will you become a grihasta? No need. So then 11,000 sons in one go, Narad Muni turned them into renunciers. So Daksha became so angry. So now he's telling Narad Muni, how did you make them all sannyasis? You didn't realize that they have debts. They have debts and they can only renounce the world 
after they fulfilled their debts. So you actually did a great disservice. So this is Daksha's argument. So Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada explains. As soon as a Brahmana takes birth, he assumes three kinds of debts. Debts to the great saints, debts to the demigods, and debts to his father. The son of a Brahmana must undergo celibacy brahmacharya to clear his debts to the saintly person. He must perform ritualistic ceremonies to clear his debts to the demigods. And he must beget children to become free from the debts to his father. Prajapati Daksha argues that although the renounced order is recommended for liberation, one cannot attain liberation unless one fulfills his obligations to the demigods, the saints and his father. Since Daksha's sons had not liberated themselves from these three debts, how could Naras Muni have led them to the renounced order of life? Apparently, Prajapati Daksha did not know the final decision of the Shastras, as stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.5.41. Deva Shibhuta Pinanam Pitinam Nakin Karonayam Rini Charajan Sarvatmanaya Saranam Saranyam Gato Mukundam Paririthya Kartam Everyone is indebted to the demigods, to living entities in general, to his family, to the Pitas, and so on. But if one fully surrenders to Krishna, Mukunda, who can give one liberation, <coughs> even if one performs no yajyas, one is free from all debts. Even if one does not repay his debts, he is free from all debts if he renounces the material world for the sake of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whose lotus feet are the shelter of everyone. This is the verdict of the Shastra. Therefore, Narad Muni was completely right in instructing the sons of Prajapati Daksha to renounce this material world immediately and take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Unfortunately, Prajapati Daksha, the father of the Hariyashvas and the Savalashvas, did not understand the great service rendered by Narayanani. Daksha therefore addressed him as Baba, the personality of sinful activities, and a sadhu, a non-saintly person. Since Narayanani was a great saint and Vaishnava, he tolerated all such accusations from Prajapati Daksha. He merely performed his duty as a Vaishnava by delivering all the sons of Prajapati Daksha, enabling them to return home back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada ki Jaya Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chakshur Nimitam Yena Tasmai Shigurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadam Tikam Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Atapada Kamalan Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathanvitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Savadhutam Badishana Sritam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamsha E Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kantara
So sometimes parents become very angry if their children renounce the world. I also have personal experience. <laughs> one time there was one young, uh, young boy who wanted to join the temple. So his father came. His father was so angry that he wanted to join the temple. So his father called the temple president, everyone. I was also in the room. So his father said, I don't mind he can give his life to Krishna. I don't mind. But first he should get married. Then he should get a job. Then she should learn responsibility. Then he should bring his children up to be good citizens. And then once he's done all of those things, I have no problem. I will be the first person he should give his life to Krishna. But first he should do all of those things. So the devotee looked at his father and said, Okay. So then we let him go. You've grown up. You got a job. <laughs> you had your children. They've now grown up. They're doing very well. Then we'll take you instead. <laughs> His father said, no, no, it's okay. You can take him. <laughs> so then the devotee told him, see, you always say later. We'll do. After we do everything, we'll come. Come in, Krishna. Just now coming. But it may not happen. Because in life, so many things can happen. So many things can divert you. So Narad Muni, in these children, he saw the opportunity that they don't need to go through the whole journey of life. They can directly surrender. So what is the need then for, for them to go through so many different things? In the Vedic scriptures, it's explained that there is a journey of life. And the journey of life goes through four stages. Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas. It said in Brahmacharya you learn. In Grihastha Ashram you earn. In Vanaprastha Ashram you turn. And in Sanyas Ashram you burn. No. <laughs> the idea is that you return back to Godhead. So this is the cycle of life. First you learn, then you earn, then you start to turn away from the world, and then eventually you return back home, back to Godhead. So this is the scientific way in which one's life is meant to go. But, it's explained in scripture that if one becomes a brahmachari and they can directly uh, go towards renunciation, then that is also a path that can be taken. One path is to go through the four stages and another path is to skip the two middle stages and go from one to four directly. Therefore, in some of our scriptures and some of our acharyas, we see they went directly from one to four. Can you think of any acharya in our line who went from Brahmacharya Ashram directly to Sanyas? Srila Prabhupada's own spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He was what you call a Neshtika Brahmachari. And that means one who remains renounced for their whole life. So Daksha's argument here is that he, Daksha doesn't understand that there are two options here. Either one can go through all the stages or one can go direct. But Daksha doesn't understand this second approach to life. And what he feels is that when you miss out the two middle ashrams, Grihastha and Vanaprastha, then you don't fulfill your debts. How do you fulfill your debt to your father? Prabhupada mentioned in the purport. Does anyone remember? To be a father. To be a father yourself. To have children. That's, um, 
But how do you become? How do you have children if you never get married? How do you fulfill your obligations to the demigods? Anyone remember? Prabhupada said, you have to perform what? Yagya, ritualistic activities. But when you're a renunciate, you don't do ritualistic activities. You're simply engaged in hearing and chanting and preaching. So there's no karma kanda, no rituals. So how do you fulfill your obligations if you don't become a grihastha, he's thinking. So therefore, Daksha is thinking, if they miss out these two ashrams, how they will fulfill their obligations? But Srila Prabhupada explains that the Bhagavatam tells us that if you surrender to Krishna, then simply by surrendering to Krishna, you don't have to do anything else to fulfill your obligations because when you water the root of the tree, then what happens? All the branches, all the twigs, all the leaves automatically become satisfied. Because you're watering the root. Therefore, in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna will say, Yada yada hi dharmasya glane bhavati bharata abhyutanama dharmasya tadatmanam srijaniyaham paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chatuskritam dharmasansta panarthaya sambhavani yuge yuge. Krishna says, I come to this world. Why does Krishna come to this world? Dharmasansta to establish. Agreed? Krishna comes to this world to establish Dharma. But what does Krishna say at the end of the Bhagavad Gita? Sarva Dharma Parityaja. Give up all Dharma. Isn't that a contradiction? <laughs> On one hand, Krishna says, I come to the world to establish Dharma. And then 30 minutes later, at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, give up all dharma. So does Krishna want you to follow dharma? Or does Krishna want you to give up dharma? What's your understanding? Which one do you want to follow? Follow dharma or give up dharma? Both. How do you follow something and give it up at the same time? Um, when you are uh, in sand, you can get everything up and just um, surround to Krishna. But when you are not like um, on that uh, on that platform, you have to do everything. Exactly. Everything. So the purpose of dharma is to lead you to bhakti. The goal of dharma is bhakti. So while following dharma helps you to get to bhakti, is useful. But once you've attained bhakti, once you've surrendered to Krishna, once you've attained the ultimate goal, you don't need to practice dharma anymore. The great souls may still practice dharma even when they fully awaken bhakti to educate the people in general that dharma is good. But basically, the great souls don't have to follow dharma because the goal of dharma, or following duty and obligation and righteous living, the goal of that is to attain love. So Narad Muni here is telling the Haryashvas and Sabalashvas, you have the opportunity to just absorb yourself in bhakti. You can just directly love Krishna. And if you directly love Krishna, don't worry about all your other dharma, that will automatically be fulfilled because the goal of dharma is to attain bhakti. And therefore if you attain bhakti then you fulfill the purpose of dharma and then you no longer will have any debts towards any of these uh, objects. And so this is uh, uh, the higher understanding. But Prajapati Daksha, he doesn't have this understanding because Prajapati Daksha is not a, 
a pure devotee of Krishna. Prajapati Daksha knows something about Shastra, he knows something about Dharma, he knows something about following Vedic regulations. But what Prajapati Daksha doesn't understand is what the goal of all of that is. Sometimes people follow religion, but they have no idea of the goal. Sometimes people come to the temple, but they have no idea of what the purpose of coming to a temple actually is. Or sometimes they do have an understanding, but what they're doing is just coming and practicing religion and coming to the temple for some lower material reason. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, religion can be performed on four levels. The lowest level is when you practice religion out of bhaya, that means fear. Higher than that is when you practice religion out of asha, and that means material desire. Higher than that is when you practice religion out of kartavya, and that means duty. But higher than all of those purposes of practicing religion is when you practice religion out of love. Love. And so uh, Narad Muni wants to lead the Hariyashvas and the Savlashvas into pure love for Krishna. And he sees that for them there's no need to go through the steps of Dharma. They're ready. And therefore he tells them, Sarva dharman paritya ja, ma me kam sarvam baja. Give, all, give it all up and just surrender. But for many people in the world, that may not be practical. For many people in the world, that may not be the path that's most suitable for them. For many people in the world, it doesn't make sense to give up your family, to give up everything and to just immediately try to uh, surrender everything to Krishna. Therefore, for most people, they can go through the four stages of life, and that's perfect, and that's beautiful. Even Srila Prabhupada went through the four stages. But there may be some individuals who can take the other route, and here Narad Muni saw that there was an opportunity, and so he encouraged them to go in that direction. And so in this way we can see, when we look at our own life, we should choose the path that is most suitable for us. Which one is better? The four stages or the direct path? The best one is the one that's suited to you. And so some of our great souls were Grihastas and they went through the stages. And some were Neshtika Brahmacharis and they didn't. But both of them uh, achieved, were uh, completely absorbed in love for Krishna. So everyone should just take the path that is most suitable for them. And here Narad Muni introduced the Hariyashvas and the Samalashvas to the path that would be most suitable for them. And in this way their lives became successful. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. So if anyone has any questions, or, uh, if you have any comment or anything, or you would like clarification on yes. I was always wondering because Daksha was instructed by Krishna to populate the universe. This was also his service. Is this not a conflict in interest? Yes. yes. So Daksha was given a service by Krishna and Daksha's service was to populate the universe. So then Narad Muni, why is he giving Daksha a hard time? Narad Muni, shouldn't he realize that this is Krishna's will? Daksha is just doing his service. Narad Muni realizes that there's different ways in which Daksha can achieve his service. So later on, what happens is after Daksha has 10,000 sons, they renounce. Then he has another 1,000 sons, they renounce. Then how does, what does Daksha do next? 
He has more children. But who are those children? He has 60 daughters. And Daksha is able to still complete his service to Krishna because Narayan Muni doesn't try to make the daughters into sannyasis. He realizes that for them it's more natural to go into family life. And so, yes, Daksha had a service to Krishna, but Daksha also had a responsibility to do the best for his sons. And so, the best for his sons would be to immediately take shelter of Krishna. But at the same time, Daksha had a service to Krishna, but there was another way to perform that service to Krishna, which was by having daughters. And those daughters could then go on and be married and populate the universe. So therefore, there was a win-win. Uh, there was a way in which both things could be satisfied. And so Narad Muni knew that, yes, even if I make his sons renounce, Still, Daksha won't be affected in his ability to perform his service because later on he can have other children and those children can perform uh, the task that he wants uh, to do for Krishna. But right here is an opportunity for someone to go back home, back to Godhead. And when the opportunity is there for someone to go back home, back to Godhead, that must be the priority above everything. Srila Prabhupada once said, if I can make one pure devotee of Krishna, my whole mission will be a success. So when Daksha saw, uh, when Narad saw that was, there was an opportunity here, he realized we must take advantage. But what about Daksha's service to Krishna? Well, that will be performed later on. There are many ways to achieve that. But for now, the priority is to give his sons the best opportunity to perfect their lives. Does that make sense? <coughs> Anyone else? Um, if I got it correctly, what you were saying is that like, for some people, it's more suitable to go through all the stages, and for some people, it's more suitable to just go from one to four. Mm -hmm. But isn't it sometimes displayed in a way that like you were also saying, like it's it's still like if somebody can do it to go from one to four is still like the most uncomplicated or easy kind of way, or do they get that wrong? Yeah. So there are two. So there are two parts. One is to go through all the stages, and the other one is to just go directly from brahmacharya to sannyas. So I said, um, I was asking the question, which is the best? And my answer was, the best one is the one that's suitable to you. But then yes, one can say, the best one is also the one which is least complicated. There is always a danger when you begin engaging with the material energy that many things could go wrong. Remember the story of the sage who went to the Ganga, the banks of the Ganga, and he said, now I'm just going to sit here and chant. So then as he was chanting, he heard, uh, he, a thought came in his mind that uh, I'm sitting here chanting, but uh, I don't have anything. What am I going to wear tomorrow? I need another set of clothes, otherwise what am I going to do? Uh, I won't be able to have clean clothes tomorrow. So then he said, okay, I'll come back to my chanting in a second. Let me just get another pair of dhoti and kurta, and I'll just wash it and keep it there. Then I'll sit down and chant. So he got a pair of dhoti kurta, he hung it on the line. Then he said, okay, now I'll chant. So he began chanting. And as soon as he was chanting, he heard the sound of a rat. And the rat was eating away at his dhoti, which was on the line. So he was chanting, but he couldn't concentrate because he heard the rat. So he said, oh my God, this rat is going to eat my dhoti. And then if it eats my dhoti, I won't be able to wear something tomorrow. So I need to do something. So then he went away and he decided to buy a cat. <laughs> So then he brought the cat and he kept the cat there 
and then he sat down to chant. He thought, if there's a cat, then the rat won't come. If the rat doesn't come, then the dhoti will be there. Then I'll be able to wear it tomorrow. So he began chanting. And then as soon as he began chanting, then what happened is the cat started crying. Meow, meow. He realized, oh my God. Someone needs to feed the cat. The cat also needs to, you know, needs some milk. So then he got up from his chanting, he got a cow. <laughs> so I need to get some milk. So I need to get the cow, to get some milk, to feed the cat, to make sure that the rat stays away so that my dhoti is there so that I can chant and I can wear something tomorrow. So then he brought the cow. So then you know, he's saying, there's a cow, there's a cat. <laughs> and then he says, uh, so he begins chanting. And then the cow moves and begins like crying and realizes, oh no, the, the cow also needs someone to milk it. So then he said, maybe I should get married. <laughs> because then I'll have my wife. She can milk the cow so that we can get the milk to feed the cat so that the rat will stay away so that I'll have my dhoti. <laughs> So that I can peacefully chant, knowing that I have something to wear tomorrow. Anyway, <laughs> like this, it went on and on and on. Because as soon as you begin engaging with the material world, life becomes very, very complex. It's very dangerous. Therefore, if you can go the direct path, and have less engagement with the material energy, in one sense, it's safer. But, maybe that's not relevant for us, maybe that's not practical. So then what we do, is we can become Vihastas. But, what did Srila Prabhupada say? Simple living, I think. Most people nowadays are simply living, hardly thinking. But our concept is simple living, high thinking. So if we go the route where we go through all the ashrams, that's still okay. But we have to be careful because when you get engaged with the material energy, we can become very, very distracted. And life can become so complex that in order to survive in this world, we have no time left to worship Krishna. And so, uh, <clears throat> like this, in one sense we can say yes, the direct path is better because it's less risky, more simple, less distraction. But if we go the other path, we can still protect ourselves through Srila Prabhupada's instructions to try to live simply. Does it make sense? Good. Alright. Any last question? The material world uh, doesn't give us the full facility to worship Krishna. But, but we're still here. But we're here, we have yes. We have this body. We're in the body, yes. So, uh, um, yeah, how to lessen it? Chanting Mahamantra it was a nice story about the sage. It's very nice stuff. Beautiful stuff. To lessen it, to make it less. Yeah. But we understand nevertheless that is not for worship. We understand nevertheless that is not for mantra. We understand nevertheless that is not You mean this material world? Yeah, I, I, I don't need it, but I, I, mean, can't, I can't get rid of it so fully because it's not yeah. possible. It's, it's filtered to things that I can do it. I can't, yes. 
about how to these contradictions they are. Srila uh, Prabhupada, he said, yeah, Srila Prabhupada, he said, make the best use of a bad bargain. We're in this world, there are so many distractions, there are so many difficulties, there are so many obstacles. Uh, it's a, in one sense, it's a bad bargain. The devotees also, they realize Kali Yuga is a difficult time. Sometimes devotees get into Kali Yuga Kata. <laughs> Oh, it's really bad out there, you know, it's so difficult, it's Kali Yuga, it's hard, it's difficult. But once there was devotees, they were talking about Kali Yuga. They said, Kali Yuga, very bad, very bad, very difficult. And then one person, he came up from the back and he said, Kali Yuga? It's not Kali Yuga. This is Chaitanya Yuga. <laughs> So you can, Mataji, you can see the world and say, no, no, very bad, very bad, very difficult, very hard, very, maybe impossible, maybe small chance, very difficult. Or you can say, this is Chaitanya Yuga. Goranga is here. And when Goranga is here, then Goranga makes even very difficult things. Very, very easy. Goranga makes that which is very, very high, very, very achievable. Because by the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, even uh, the lame can cross mountains, the blind can see stars in the eyes, the dumb person can speak eloquently, and even someone who is very weak can also attain perfection. So yes, it's difficult. But the holy name of Krishna is very, very powerful. So, Kale dosha nile rajan asti hyeko mahan guna kirtana deva krishna syan mukta sangha padam bhajan. Kali Yuga is an ocean of faults. Asti, however, eko, one mahan guna, great quality. There's one great quality in Kali Yuga. Kirtanad, Eva Krishna Sya, chant Krishna's names, Mukta Sangha, and you become released from all the difficulties, Param Rajait, and you attain the supreme destination. So yes, it's difficult, but we make the best use of a bad bargain and realize that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, um, where we struggle, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will make up the difference if we take shelter of him. Thank you so much. Yes? Um, I have a question. You talked about the four different stages of religion and how we can have people come uh, out of fear and out of material desires. And the fourth is um, out of love. But when we are coming, we don't have this love. You know, we don't, do not understand how to attain this love. And I think at least for me, it's like we try to be happy and to find ways to be happy. And after we, we saw so many things which do not make us make happy because they're not permanently. It seems for me like it is the only reasonable way to become happy because other things I have tried out. And how how this and this concept when you know your stage that um, you're not there like already. You have this prema, or maybe you don't even know that this goal is somehow achievable. How do you position yourself in this, you know, somehow egoistic way? Because, yeah. Yeah, so we understand that prema or love is the highest, but if we are honest, then we are not there. We have many agendas, we have many desires. Uh, so, how do we get there? How do we get to prema? The first thing, Mataji, is that it's not that you are... It's not that these are just stages. You go from one to two to three to four. There is elements of all of these. Like say, for example, if someone is on the level of fear. But they also have some material desires as well. And say someone is on the level of material desire 
but they also have some gratitude towards Krishna, a little bit of dutifulness as well. And maybe someone who is on the dutifulness, they also have some love for Krishna. So the point is, you can't say you don't have any love for Krishna. Isn't it? Have some love for Krishna. Maybe it's small, but some love is there. And then what we do in Krishna consciousness is whatever love we have, we try to use that to serve Krishna selflessly. And what happens is when we find those moments where we love Krishna and serve him selflessly, then it enlivens our heart so much that we feel, I should love Krishna more. I should serve selflessly more. <coughs> And uh, it's like sometimes when there's prasadam time and you're very hungry, but you make the sacrifice to serve the devotees. Okay, let's serve. Then what sometimes happens is after you've served all the devotees, you know what happens, right? You actually feel like your own hunger has disappeared. Just by serving selflessly, you feel, oh, okay, actually, I don't need to eat so much. It was just nice to serve. And then in the future, when the opportunity comes to serve, you think, that was so nice to serve selflessly. Maybe I can do it again. And like this, what happens is more and more we realize, if I try to make myself happy, then I become miserable. But if I try to make Krishna happy, that's what actually fulfills my heart. So there's a beautiful verse in the seventh canto where Prahlad Maharaj says, one is happy so long as they don't try to be happy. The moment you start endeavouring for your own happiness, your misery begins. And therefore the mantra of life is, don't try to be happy. Try to serve. Don't try to be happy. It doesn't work. <laughs> but try to serve. And if you serve, then Krishna uh, enchants your heart. And then everything comes. Is that okay? Yes, Marj. Okay, last one and then we finish. I was just saying Recently, I received a request. Um, I, it is written in Chaimat Karma and different books that eh? we are Jivas. I will stay Jivas forever. We are Jiva Tattva. Yes. We will stay in, in Jiva Tattva. But we know that Krishna is one of the highs that we are all uh, the servants of Krishna to make to give him pleasure. Yes, all that makes us happy. Is this correct? Yes, Shastra says, Jivera Svarupa Hoi, Krishnera Nityadas, Krishnera Tatasta Shakti, Veda Veda Prakash. The Jiva is eternally the servant of Krishna. And therefore, we eternally serve Krishna. But the most amazing thing is that the devotee of Krishna derives more happiness than Krishna himself. And therefore, because the devotee of Krishna derives more happiness in the relationship than Krishna himself, Krishna himself comes to serve his devotees. Krishna himself comes to experience what it would be like to be a devotee. Krishna actually comes to the world as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and accepts the mood of Radharani. Because the devotee of Krishna, in their service to Krishna, experiences more happiness than even Krishna himself. So the fact that we are Jiva Tattva and eternally in a position to serve Krishna is the most amazing news in the universe. Because no one derives more happiness than the person who becomes the greatest servant. And the more you become a servant, the more you develop selflessness, 
the more we give up our selfish, self-centered mentality, the more our life becomes beautiful. And that is the great opportunity that all of us have. Grantaraj Shimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai